don't need a high-end designer or a lot of money to get a luxe look. Be your own interior designer. This is Affordable Interior Design, the podcast. Here's your host, Betsy Hellman. Hi, everybody. How is your September going? My September is off to an amazing start because the kids are back in school and I am terrified with coronavirus, with Delta variants popping up. It is a nerve wracking time, but my poor son was a virtual learner all year last year and he was really sad. And so today on the first day of school, he says to me, he says, I have been waiting for this all year. This is going to be the best day ever. And Jack, yes, I hope that it is the best day ever. And I hope wherever your kids are going to school that they have an amazing day. It is a time when I'm really excited for them to regain that sense of community and of course to be learning again because the virtual learning did not stick. (laughs) But, um, you know, we're not out of the woods with this coronavirus thing. So I sent him out the door with an N95 mask and I'm just hoping, hoping that he stays nice and safe. And I'm hoping that your kids stay nice and safe wherever they are. And here's to a great school year. Speaking of school year, uh, I got some news. So my son, it's really exciting because he is going to be a fifth grader. He is a fifth grader. So he goes to school and then after school, he used to go to like the after school program, but because of coronavirus, we're trying to limit the exposure. So we said he could walk home. But our home is actually very close to the neighboring town. It's like the furthest possible house from the school. So instead of walking quote unquote home, he walks to my storefront, which is really cute because he has like a walking buddy and he feels super independent. And yet it's very safe to have him just meander down Main Street and come right to me. But of course, things can't always be a bed of roses. I just heard from my landlord that they are hiking up the rent. And my landlord's been a piece of work now for a while. Um, After the flood and all the numerous things that have gone down at this storefront, he has not been super helpful. And I think it's just a sign that I might need to move on. So just as we've gotten this all beautifully worked out or my son can autonomously walk to my work and everyone's feeling safe and cozy, the apple cart has to be upset. Hopefully you don't have too many upset apple carts where you are, but I am relishing each final day in my storefront. It might be over at the end of this month. I'm hoping to negotiate with him just for a little bit longer because Unfortunately, my beautiful, amazing storefront has felt less amazing after the flood from, was it July, and a few other events. So it seems like the writing was on the wall, but this is a very special place where I have grown this podcast, where I have grown my business. And so my heartstrings are being tugged because I'm going to miss my little fishbowl, my little window on the world here um, on main street, who knows where my next chapter will be, but I will be opening an even more amazing location very soon. Stay tuned. And while I plan all of that in the background, keep sending me your questions. So I have a distraction from coronavirus and increased rents, send it to info at affordable interior design.com. Or actually the more efficient way to do things would be to go to affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast. And there you can fill out a form that will get your question right to me just in time to have me get it on the air. And without further ado, I'm going to kick it off with our first question of the day. It comes from Brandy. Brandy is writing from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Actually, full disclosure, I just got off the phone, the Zoom phone, with Brandy this morning because she's interested in the academy. 
And I think it is so exciting to hear where people are, what they're looking for, to hear about their dreams and aspirations, and why they're considering pursuing the Academy. And Brandy, we would love to have you. I hope that you enroll and let me know if you have any questions. But one thing that came up during my discussion with Brandy is that she's thinking about starting a family soon, and she's just wondering how to balance a career with having kids. And as you heard me mention earlier in the podcast, the interior design business, being your own boss, opening an interior design firm, whether it's just you working at the place or whether you decide to collaborate with a larger team and have team members with you, um, it is such an amazing job for somebody who's looking for work-life balance, for somebody who wants to spend time with their kids, but also maybe the kids are at school or maybe they still want to have a career in addition to taking care of kids, but they don't want to miss soccer. They want to be going to the Girl Scout meetings. They want to be there to pick the kids off the bus or to be there when their son walks down Main Street and comes in their office. So I always tell people who work for me, you know, who are worried about hours and things like that, that this job is amazing for parents because your clients want to meet with you when their kids are not around. Your clients want to meet with you when they're not distracted by, mom, where's my snack? Dad, have you seen my backpack? And so they want to meet with you when the kids are at school. And you have availability when the kids are at school. So it really works out beautifully. And plus, it's a career where people will work around your schedule. So they'll be understanding if you have a soccer game and you can move the appointment from one to three. And people are generally pretty chill about it because we're not doing brain surgery over here. And uh, it's just a really fabulous career to go into if you want some balance. Of course, you may need to work for yourself. I can't speak to balance at a firm because when I worked for a firm, you know, I had to punch the time clock and I went in at a certain time and left at a certain time. And I don't know, maybe I could have gotten out for a soccer game, but it wasn't something I needed to worry about at that time. And I did not see other people at the firm doing that. So that's why being your own boss is liberating. And Brandy, hopefully that story at the top of the show illustrated that for you. Let's hear more about your question. You write, Betsy, thank you so much for the feedback on my living room layout. You responded to my question in June, on June 17th, which actually happens to be my birthday. So thank you for the awesome birthday present. I was wondering, what sort of lighting do you typically do in open concept rooms with eight foot ceilings? Our dining room is in the center of our living space. It is the only statement lighting that's going to hang from the ceiling in the room. Is it okay for a pendant or chandelier to hang above the dining table, even though it will come just about to my six feet tall husband's chin? Or would something like a flush mount or semi-flush be more appropriate? Attached is a picture that shows you the view of the main living space from the kitchen. The dining room will be centered in the room in front of the bay window area. Thanks again for all the design help that you offer on this podcast. Brandy, I'm happy to help. I'm happy to help. And I love this picture. You know, as you told me today, this is a new build and you've been working on it since the beginning for nearly a year. That is very exciting. And it's liberating to be able to make some of these foundational choices. But also it's difficult because there's nothing already there for you to replicate. So let me tell you a couple of guidelines that you would, of course, learn in the academy, but you can also learn some of this stuff right here on this podcast. So generally, generally, if I'm working in a room that has eight foot ceilings, I will only do a flush mount light fixture because you don't want anybody hitting their head. You don't want anything to feel like it's coming down or gosh forbid, make the room feel less high. So with eight foot ceilings, which are standard, right? Uh, I just do flush mounts. They have to be nine foot ceilings and above for me to do something like a semi flush or chandelier. All that being said, the one time, well, maybe there's a couple other times like with a kitchen island or something like that. But another time when I would hang a fixture that comes down like a pendant or a chandelier would be above the dining table. 
And the reason is because your six foot tall husband is not walking under the dining table because the table is there. So nobody's going to be walking under that fixture. Nobody's going to hit their head. Nobody's going to hit the bag of groceries as they're walking to the kitchen because the table will prevent you from being under the fixture. And most times people hang their dining room fixture way too high. So let me give you that number. So from the top of the table to the bottom of the fixture, it's 29 to 34 inches. So you'll measure, you'll take your measuring tape top of the table, you'll take it to the bottom of the fixture, that final crystal on the chandelier or whatever, right? The shade on the pendant, and that should be 29 to 34 inches. That will be perfect. It will look really appropriate because you want the fixture to be in relationship to the dining table, not the fixture to be in relationship to the ceiling. So even if I had 12 foot high ceilings, I would still choose a chandelier that would be hung 29 to 34 inches above the dining table because it's that relationship that's important. All right, Brandy, I hope that helped. And guys, if you're clamoring to see Brandy's picture, well, now you've probably heard that we have a YouTube channel, an Instagram page, a Facebook page. We have show notes now. People were asking me for years, Betsy, would you do show notes? And I just didn't have the time. But now I still don't have the time. And yet I have the money to hire somebody else to make all of this happen. So you'll head over to affordableinteriordesign.com slash links. Once again, that's affordableinteriordesign.com slash L-I-N-K-S. And there you can see links to all the different pages that will show you all the different pictures. All right, Brandy, on to my next question. My next question comes from Joanne, and Joanne is writing from Sanford, Florida. Joanne writes, hi, Betsy, I submitted a question or two about my two-year-old home in Florida. I forgot to mention that my husband and I are empty nesters. We finally have a bit of money to decorate after raising four children and putting them through college. Can we stop right there? That's amazing, Joanne. Kudos to you. I cannot imagine. I have two and they fill my days and nights with joy and activities. So good for you. Um, Let's get back into it. You write, my youngest is in her last year of college. I took your quiz on your website, affordableinteriordesign.com, and my style came up as contemporary. I have a kitchen table, which my father bought for me at least 25 years ago, and that I'm going to use. And I've made do with it by matching a cabinet from World Market. We purchased a new sectional and garden district mirrors from Ballard Designs. I want to create a cohesive look, but I'm finding it hard. What woods can I match with my current furniture? Would a white console behind my sectional be out of place? I can't seem to decide on the end tables either. I think I'm so used to making do over the years that I have no experience with actually selecting something that would look good. Any advice you can give me is wonderful. I like rustic, contemporary, and boho styles. As you can see, I'm all over the place. Thank you, Joanne. I'm happy to help. And yes, if you want to see how all over the place Joanne is, don't forget about affordableinteriordesign.com slash links. But I'm looking at your pictures here and I am seeing sort of a variety of different styles. I'm seeing a couple of things that I would love to point out. So, you know, when we're talking about dealing with woods, which is what you're specifically asking about, There's three categories of woods for the most part. I'm just generalizing, right? There's dark woods, like that espresso cappuccino colored wood. There's mid-tone woods, like acorns and walnuts. And then there's light woods, like birches and beeches, right? Those are the three categories. And our woods do not have to exactly match, right? But they need to share the same category or family all dark woods, all mid-tone woods, or all light woods. Now, as you may or may not know from listening to episode upon episode of this podcast, and of course from reading my book cover to cover, painted woods do not count as a wood tone. So if the wood is painted so that you cannot see a wood grain, 
then it counts not as a wood tone, but as that element. So for instance, say you did do a white buffet, then you would have used a white element, not a wood element. Now, if it's just white stained or white washed and you can clearly see the wood grain, then that's sort of the direction your woods need to go, if that makes sense. I think the main problem here is not with the woods, it's with the commitment to the style. If I were looking at this space and had to name it a style, which you know I like to do because every space needs two words, a style word and a feeling word. That's that two word phrase. And then for those of you in the academy, you know it's a three word phrase because as designers, we always need to make things look sophisticated. Of course, even if you're not a designer, you'll want things to be sophisticated, but you really have to have that eye and be looking for that polish. I think your home, Joanne, is on its way to being sophisticated. However, I think you're in between styles. You've got this rustic sideboard from World Market that's got kind of a rustic wood finish with the louver style front doors and then the bronze metal detailing. Then you've got a somewhat rustic trestle dining table. It could be rustic or even transitional, right? And it is that mid-tone wood family, which is the exact same as the sideboard. So I definitely think your wood tones are a mid-tone family. Then you've got a mix of black wood dining chairs, which I think look great with the table. And then the head and foot chairs have black legs, but they are like this gray beige fabric. I actually think it looks really nice. I do feel like the silver dining fixture is out of place because from the artwork to to the etagere behind the dining table to that sideboard, we're dealing with dark metals. And just like the woods, your metals have a family as well. So you're either going with all cool metals, which are silvers, nickels, chromes, all dark metals, which is what I can see you've done here, like oil rubbed bronze, wrought iron, black metals. And then we also have warm metals, golds, brasses, coppers. Definitely stay clear of the warm metals. I don't see them used anywhere in here. But even your coffee table, which appears to be open to your dining room, this living dining concept, has the dark metal base. Your end table has the dark metal base. So really, I think you've made some choices with mid-tone woods and dark metals, and I want you to stay in those lanes. Okay, Joanne? Now, let's get talking about the choices for the other materials in the space. So you say that now that you're able to select things, you don't know what to select. And I would not say that that's what I'm seeing here in these pictures. You know, whenever I'm designing a space, I'm always asking myself, what materials have I not yet used? And I can see here, as you've heard me mention on the show, that you have used woods, you have used metals, your end table by the sectional is a glass, so that ticks that box. You have a very interesting mosaic on the coffee table. And then, you know, the one element that jumps out at me that you have not used is stone. But then I look at your flooring. Your flooring is all stone-looking tile. So that is definitely a large dose of stone. I think you have done a beautiful job using a mix of materials. A couple of materials I see missing, I see ceramic missing, right? That's an easy one to weave in. Uh, with like a lamp or even an interesting centerpiece bowl. You could always do some more glass because the end table is just a very small element. So maybe you could think about like an elongated glass chandelier above the dining table, like something rectilinear that's maybe framed with that black metal to keep that cohesive throughout the space. And the big thing, that's really missing for me, Joanne, that's like smacking me in the face as I scroll through these pictures, there is no gosh darn color in any of these pictures. It is all like a gradation from light gray to black. And for me, that's a real miss in terms of opportunity. 
I would definitely be getting a large area rug. Right now you have a magic carpet ride for your coffee table, a little circular rug that's maybe five foot in diameter under a three foot diameter coffee table. What a missed opportunity. You can make this living area look so much longer and wider by using a long and wide rug right? And also swapping out some of this artwork that is also monochromatic for something that offers a splash of color. So that gives you opportunity to bring in throw pillows, a throw blanket, maybe even an accent chair. So that would be my main critique of the space. I definitely feel like the vibe in here is rustic. So I would be going down that rabbit hole as you're committing to your two-word phrase. But let's bring a little vibrancy. Let's bring some color. Those are the choices I want to see you make, Joanne. Guys, I hope you're making choices in your space. I hope you're being bold and listening to the rules I'm laying out here on the podcast because following simple rules, whether you have an eye for design, a knack for design, if you feel you've always dreamed of being an interior designer, or you just like to listen to this podcast while you wash dishes, These are real world rules that I not only share in the podcast, but I teach in the academy. I use every gosh darn day. So use these as a framework to make those choices. Don't be scared to fold in some color. Don't be scared to buy a piece that wasn't just a hand-me-down, instead is more of an investment. Just do so staying within the lines and you won't go wrong. Guys, keep your questions coming. As I mentioned last week, the mailbag is light. We could use some of your questions, your beautiful pictures, and your wonderful, inspiring ideas. Send them over affordableinteriordesign.com slash podcast, and I'll be right back with you next week. Bye. A big thank you to our amazing producer, Catherine Heller, to Aton and the MBCR House Band, and to Affordable Interior Design, the sponsor of this podcast and the premier place to get an amazing look on a budget. Check out affordableinteriordesign.com. If you guys love the show, the very best way to support us is by spreading the word. Tell your friends or write us an awesome review on iTunes. So until next week, guys, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.